Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay, that's very loud in my ear. Sorry, could the tech guy. Right, everyone, I think we're good to go. So welcome to this event, um, which we're going to talk about the flow country. And if you haven't been to the flow country in the north of Scotland, then you really should. And why should you? Because it's one of the best peatland resources in Scotland. And Scotland is really well endowed with peatland. So uh, to say that the flow country is one of the best um, sites in Scotland is truly remarkable. And why is peatland important? Um, I'm sure you all know this, but peatland has the potential to sequester carbon to a significant degree. So it is vital for tackling the climate crisis that we're here to talk about, but it also plays a really strong role in supporting nature, but also supporting um, our rural communities as we restore peatland to support um, climate and nature and tackle the twin nature climate crises. So I'm delighted that I've been joined today by five amazing speakers, some in person in um, the blue zone of COP26, some online to tell you about the flow country. And we will hear from our amazing speakers um, in just a short time, very quickly, they are Paul Walton from the RSPB, who is sitting next to me in the room. Um, they are Millie Haywood, who is a volunteer at the Forzenard Flows uh, in um, the Highlands. And Millie is also joining me in person. And then online, we have Des Thompson um, from Nature Scott, um, his, the Principal Advisor on Biodiversity. Roxanne Anderson from the University of the Highlands who are carrying out such um, important research on peatland restoration and Joe Perry, the climate coordinator from the Highland Council with whom we work in partnership on restoration. So welcome to everyone online and in person. And we are going to kick off with a short video about the flows. This is Blanket Bog at RSPB Forsenard, part of the vast flow country. What do you see? Not much? Try again. Beneath the rich wet landscape is peat. Lots of it. It can be up to 10 metres deep. It's slowly built up over centuries, adding just a millimetre every year. This peat stores carbon. The flow country stores twice as much as all of the UK's woodlands put together. So keeping these bogs wet and healthy is incredibly important for fighting climate change. But it's also important for nature. This huge patchwork of water and land is home to rare birds, animals and plants. We need these special places and RSPB Scotland is working to restore them where they have been damaged and preserve them where they're healthy. So there you go. It always pays to take a closer look. So if that's not whetted your appetite, uh, whetted being a great pun in this context, if that's not whetted your appetite to visit the flows, then I don't know what will. And I'm delighted now to hand over to Paul Walton, who from an RSPB perspective is going to tell us why the flow country is so important. Thanks very much, Francesca. Um, okay, so can I have a first slide, please? Thanks very much. And if we just move on to the next one, please. Okay, so um, I'm from Glasgow. Next slide, please. There we are. Um, so uh, I get the opportunity to welcome you to our city. Um, and a really warm welcome it is in the collective hope that this conference delivers what it must. So next slide, please. We're here to talk about um, peatlands today, bogs. Um, 
And this is what it looks like. Now, this is the blanket bog of the flow country. It is a vast landscape. And it, the landscape is created by plants. Now, next slide, please. In particular, this, which is sphagnum moss. Now, sphagnum absolutely loves acidic, waterlogged conditions. Indeed, it creates waterlogged conditions. And in the sort of the igneous volcanic rock of Scotland, which is acidic, and with our incredibly wet climate, which some of you will have experienced already, it finds incredibly good habitat. And since the ice retreated from Scotland 8,000 years ago, this moss has been growing and dying profusely in the peatlands, but it's only decomposing partially. And so the peatland grows year after year, just in the millimeters every year, but it has been growing ever since for thousands of years over an area in the flow country of 4,000 square kilometers. Next slide, please. Now, peatlands globally are in areas like tropical rainforest and, uh, 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 and woodlands around the world and in open country. Um, and it occupies an area about maybe half of Brazil, the size of Brazil. But blanket bog habitat, like we have in the flow country, is actually an incredibly rare habitat globally. So what we have in Scotland and in the flow country in particular is of huge significance uh, in, in global terms. Next slide, please. Uh, and in the 1970s, um, it was slowly beginning to dawn on ecologists like myself just how important this habitat is for the very special wildlife community that it supports. Indeed, that it is made of. That's the plants, the shrubs, and the animals and birds in particular. There are nine species of birds with nationally important populations in this area. At the same time, the UK government of the time, Mrs. Thatcher's government, came into power in 1979, the year when I first visited the flow country. The government realized there was high unemployment in the far north of Scotland and wanted to find an answer to it. And the answer they settled on was to promote commercial forestry, planting non-native species in open country. Next slide, please. And the result of that was fiscal incentives and tax breaks for private forestry that led to the plowing of the flow country. Now, that, when I say plowing, I mean it was very deep furrows, two of them every couple of meters. And next slide, please. On top of that were planted these non-native commercial tree species on, on the high points of the furrows that have been raised up, and then it needed to be fertilized. And so we had helicopters putting nitrogen fertilizer all over this habitat, naturally a very low nutrient habitat. Um, so uh, next slide, please. This led through the 1980s to, the this is an old ordnance survey map of the flow country on the top there. You can see it's open, empty land almost, it looks like on a map. If you look at the next slide, please. By 1990, 67,000 hectares of the flow country had been ploughed and planted up with non-native conifers. And of course that led to a loss of wildlife. Can the next slide please? And the ecological impacts of this were nothing short of catastrophic. And in the 1980s, the RSPB led a campaign of NGOs to fight this ploughing and planting of the flow country and calling for its full recognition as a wildlife habitat to be recognised. It was a furious battle. I witnessed it myself. It, it really reached fever pitch and it resulted in the late 1980s in a rare U-turn from the UK government who said, okay, we'll remove the fiscal incentives for forestry. We'll allow you to go and designate your, 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 your peatlands. And so then the real story of conservation began. Next slide, please. And it began with a, a program of removal of the forestry. And the next slide, please. 
and the active restoration of the peat bog, which my colleague Millie is actively involved with using her own hands every day up on our Forcenard Nature Reserve in the Flow Country, the RSPB Reserve, which uh, 153 square kilometres is the largest RSPB Nature Reserve in the UK. Next slide, please. Of course, since the 1980s, we've all come to realise the massive significance of the flow country, not only for wildlife, but also for carbon, as Francesca told us. And we know that there's 400 megatons of carbon stored in this 4,000 square kilometre peatland. And the key is not just in the area of it, but the depth. So the video said 10 metres in, across quite a lot of the flow country, it's six and a half metres deep. And that makes the flow country certainly the largest blanket bog in Europe and probably the largest in the world. Now, overall, soil contains three times more carbon than the atmosphere. Restoration of peat bogs is a massive global priority if we are going to keep to that 1.5 degree target. Next slide, please. So it's massively important for carbon, but I have to say it's massively important to me personally. When I first went up in 79 and heard the incredible song of the Dunlin, this, this wader, which reaches probably its highest densities anywhere in the world in the flow country, I was so profoundly moved that's kind of why I'm sitting here today. It's why I've ended up working for the RSPB. I believe we have an ethical responsibility towards this wildlife and this habitat. I believe we have a fundamental responsibility to ourselves to make sure that we restore it and conserve it for the future. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul. That was a very impassioned um, uh, intervention in terms of why peatland is important and why the flows are so important and why the work that we're doing on the flows um, across Nature Scott, across the RSPB, across a range of partners is so important. And on that note, the importance of uh, partnership working and the scale of peatland restoration that is needed. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Des Thompson, a colleague of mine at Nature Scott, Scotland's nature agency, who is going to talk about the scale of um, peatland restoration and the importance of partnership working. Over to Des on camera. Thanks very much, Francesca. Thank you, Paul, for such an impassioned uh, presentation. That was marvelous. I, I felt I was there. I'm going to take you through a few slides to really take us through the scale of the remarkable restoration work that's taken place in the flow country. Next slide, please. It's really from the air. If I could have the next slide, it's, it's from the air when you appreciate the enormity of the task here with all but the pool complexes themselves, but without trees. And as Paul said, this damage took place in the 70s and 80s. Next slide, please. And of course, it's crude, but a broken bog is a liability. And as this graphic shows, uh, degraded, damaged bog releases carbon dioxide, good condition bog, of course, um, sequesters and holds carbon dioxide, thus contributing to global warming, tackling global warming. Next slide, please. And the, the blanket bog resource as a whole is phenomenally important for holding carbon. The flow country alone holds just over two times as much carbon as we find in all the woods and forests in Britain. And globally, peatlands themselves hold two times the world's forest resource of carbon. So blanket bog just covers 3% of the Earth's surface, yet it's second only to the ocean as a carbon sink. So it's an immensely important resource to restore. Next slide, please. And a brilliant paper just published by Tannenberger and colleagues a couple of months ago in Diversity reveals the magnitude of the restoration challenge across Europe. The headline is that 25% of Europe's peatlands are degraded, 50% of all peatlands in the European Union are degraded, with de degradation increasing southwards across Europe. Britain belongs to what's called the Atlantic and raised bog, uh, assemblage of peatlands, and within that area, 68% of peatland resource is degraded, with 56% of 
of the peatlands within protected areas being degraded. So there is an enormous challenge ahead in terms of restoring these bogs. Next slide, please. And for the birds, which all have talked about so passionately, we lost populations of between 17 and 20% of these internationally important species, the Dunlin green shank and golden plover, with both green shank and Dunlin nesting at higher densities in the flow country than recorded anywhere else in the world. Next slide. And of course, these losses, next slide please, these losses were due to the afforestation, forestry with the birds avoiding areas close to tree plantations. We were very fortunate to form a small uh, research group to tackle where restoration might best take place to restore the bird populations. It was a piece of work led by Jerry Wilson, the Director of Science in RSPB. Next slide. And we published a paper in Journal of Applied Ecology where in the red areas in the map here, we could identify those areas where we should remove the trees first to restore, help restore the wader population. So by pulling the trees back by just six to 800 meters, there's a very good chance that you will get Dunlin, Golden Plover and Green Shank returning. Next slide. So we have this science to support the, the restoration and the growing knowledge base on the importance of restoration that was needed. Next slide, please. And it's only when you, again, you look from, from space and you see these great swathes of areas that have been restored through tree removal and ditch blocking. Next slide. And since 1994, almost 30 years ago, a great deal of research and trials and major restoration techniques were carried out in the flow country, initially with funding from the EU Life Programme and beyond 2001, RSPB, Nature Scotland, Forestry Land Scotland, Plant Life, and a range of other partners have been restoring the peatlands to the extent now that 2,600 hectares of forestry have been restored to blanket bog, with the lessons and techniques now being applied not just across the UK, but globally, and forming a key part of Nature Scott's peatland action programme, which I'm delighted to say now has a promise of £250 million pounds worth of funding from the Scottish Government taking us up to the end of the decade. Next slide, please. So what was actually done? Trees were felled, drains and furrows were blocked with dams, deer grazing impacts were reduced, and gradually the water table rose, bog plants colonised, the wildlife was restored. And all the time, science and monitoring was key. And we'll hear about some of this from Roxanne. Next slide. And drawing to a close, some really exciting research, which has just been published by Terra Motion. I put here, a tweet, this research was tweeted on the October the 22nd, showing now across the British peatlands, those, those areas in red, which are most degraded. And this has been uh, deduced from some satellite imagery collected over the last few years. And Roxanne will say a bit more about this. And now we can home in across Britain and Ireland and identify those degraded peatlands where we can invest in restoration and therefore reducing our emissions. Next slide, and final slide. And so a huge thank you to the massive conservation restoration research and partnership effort in this very special part of the world. And yes, you can see the Northern Lights from the flow country. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Des. And just to underline the scale point that Des was making in terms of restoration, the latest estimates in Scotland are that there are 2.3 million hectares of peatland, um, but 1.8 million hectares of that is degraded. And you'll have liked Des's broken bog um, joke on the slide. So that's 1.8 million hectares that are actually emitting carbon um, 20 percent of the inventory rather than sequestering carbon and we need to understand that and the science behind all of that if we are going to make a difference in terms of our sequestration aims and reach our net zero targets. So Des mentioned the science behind peatland restoration and I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker um, on the video link. 
Uh, Roxanne Anderson is a researcher from the University of the Highlands and Islands and is going to give us a peek into the uh, science behind peatland restoration. Roxanne, over to you. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I will only present a very brief, uh, a very brief ish view of some of the science that has been developed in the full country and that relates to one of the big problem that Des has just outlined, which is the scale of the problem and the scale of, of the, the areas of peatland that we need to better understand. And um, just before going any further, I'd just like to take this moment to thank all the contributors that have uh, inputted and led the, this work, and in particular, the funders that have enabled this research to take place. So this will be a talk about bug breathing. And can I have the next slide, please? Do bugs really breathe? No, they don't. But bug breathing is the name that has been given for a very long time to the mechanical response or the dynamic response of the surface of a peatland. When there's a lot of water in the bog, the surface rises. When the bog dewaters, the surface collapses. This pattern of rise and fall is somewhat predictable and follows seasonality in peatlands in good condition and is effectively a powerful phenomenon that relates to, to, to resilience. This has been known for an incredibly long time. However, measuring the motion, walk on the bog, you influence the motion. Therefore, we had to turn to different approach. So if I can have the next slide, please. And this is exactly what we did. The next slide, thank you. In 2016, the University of Nottingham and UHI, together with the University of Nottingham's spin-off company, Terra Motion, turned to satellite radar to study bog breathing from space. What happens or how it works is, is effectively that a satellite goes around the planet every six days, and every time it does so, sends a radar signal to the surface, the radar comes back, and that provides an idea of the position of the surface. And by building these stacks of images, you get a relative motion of the surface over time. The Terra Motion Company has developed a processing technique that enables these to be continuous over space, and therefore we have that co coverage of space and time in terms of the surface motion. The next step is then to relate this surface motion as perceived by the satellite radar to properties of the peatland on the ground. And this is an important validation step. So if I can have the next slide, please. And this is exactly what we then uh, went on and did. When what we demonstrated very effectively is that the INSAR perceived surface motion does relate to hydrological, mechanical, and, and ecological properties of the peatland, and therefore enable us to be used as a diagnostic tool for peatland conditions. Um, crudely, if a peatland is subsiding over time, it suggests that it's losing mass. That mass is more likely to be carbon and water. On the contrary, if a peatland is either stable or even uplifting over time, long periods of time, this suggests that there's a gain of mass, therefore a sequestration of carbon associated with better conditions. Bog breathing is therefore an ideal tool to study peatland condition. But if instead of looking at just long-term motion, we also look at the properties of these time series, we can even go on and look at, for example, resilience mechanism. If I can have the next slide, please. And this is exactly what we've been doing. Um, unfortunately, in the recent years, climate change has been quite visible, even in the flow country where we've had a European large, uh, wide large drought in 2018 that was followed by one of the largest ever recorded wildfire in 2019. And using the INSAR technology, we were able to demonstrate that areas in good condition had uh, a, an incredible resilience mechanism built in, whereby the surface collapsed during the drought, therefore elevating moisture content in the surface and being able to be much more resilient to fire with lower severity of burn uh, than areas that were degraded where this mecha mechanism of resilience was lacking. And of course, if you can map resilience um, over a large area, you can also derive condition uh, for these areas and be able to predict how uh, a particular area might respond to, to future change. If I can have the next slide, please. This is exactly what we went on and did. So we mapped here the condition of the whole of the flow country 
um, and we separated it in those those particular uh, end members, if you like, of the peatland condition. The wet, near natural, soft, spongy, sphagnum rich peat that has this capacity to bounce. The naturally the drier um, marginal peatland that surrounds these good, good areas. And then the drain thin and degraded peatland that lack this mechanism of response. And of course, if we can do it over the whole of the flow country, we can easily do it over the whole of Scotland, the whole of the UK, and um, as was shown by, by Des, over much larger areas. Um, but we can also do it at the side scale to look at particular responses to restoration. And if I can have the next slide, please. This is also what we did. So we went on and looked at particular sites where restoration intervention had been uh, undertaken. And we looked again, mapping those end member condition where they were more likely to be. By repeating these maps over time, we will be able to monitor the condition change in response to restoration. And by linking those condition change to emission reduction, we will be able to, to potentially use this te technique as a monitoring verification tool in the future. So if I can have the, the final slide, please. I think in summary, what I would like to say is that the flow country is an area in the north of Scotland that has enabled the development of world leading technique that can not only be applied for the flow country, but could have potential application that can support the management, restoration and monitoring of all peatlands globally. Thank you very much. Thank you much, very much, Roxanne. That was fantastic. And as you said, um, the work that is happening in the flow country cannot just help us with our 1.8 million hectares of degraded peatland in Scotland, but can also help the global peatland initiative in relation to restoration. Now, I've talked about the wonders of the flow country, and I hope you're inspired to visit, but it's not just um, us that think the flow country is amazing. Um, UNESCO potentially thinks it's amazing too. And there's a bid at the moment uh, for recognition of the flow country as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And to hear more about that, we have Joe Perry from the Highland Council. So if I can introduce Joe and over to you, please. Okay, hi there everyone. Um, so yes, my name's Joe Perry and I'm really pleased to be talking to you today um, about the Flow Country World Heritage Site project. And um, there is currently no Peatland World Heritage Site anywhere in the world. There's never been a better time to change this. And in our opinion, there is no better Peatland candidate than the Flow Country to make this change. Uh, next slide, please. So the World Heritage Site project is to some extent a legacy of the Flows to the Future project, which finished just a couple of years ago. Flows to the Future really brought the flow country to national and even international attention, in part through the creation of the striking lookout tower, which you can see on the screen here and has appeared in a few other uh, slides so far, but also um, as a result of the impressive peatland restoration work the project achieved, uh, the community engagement they carried out and through its traveling museum display, World Heritage Site status for the flow country has been slowly gathering momentum for about two decades now, but it really kicked into gear in 2018. Since that time, we've passed through the technical evaluation stage of the World Heritage Site process, and we're now the UK's candidate site. And we're now at the stage where we're putting together our full nomination package, which will go to UNESCO, all things going well, for final consideration at the end of next year. Uh, next slide, please. So when you think of a World Heritage Site, it's likely that the images that come to your mind are of built structures, such as a pyramid or a castle or a temple. Natural World Heritage Sites are indeed fewer in number, but contain some of the most well-known and important natural places in the world, including the Great Barrier Reef and the Grand Canyon. So why do we feel that the flow country can stand alongside these giants? Well, we are arguing that the flow country is the best peatland of its type anywhere in the world, and specifically that it contains the largest and best quality expanse of blanket bog. We are also arguing that the unique assemblages of birds found in the flow country also constitute outstanding universal value, which is what you must prove if UNESCO is to award World Heritage Site status. Next slide, please. 
Here we can see one of those iconic species. I thought it was a very beautiful picture of the black-throated diver. It's one of our rarest birds and the flow country is a major stronghold for them and for other important species, which we've heard a little bit about today, such as the, uh, the hen harrier, the golden plover and the dunlin. Uh, next page, please. One of the questions we get when we go out to consultation is, well, what would the benefits be? What would it do for local communities? So in the world heritage um, community worldwide, it's often commented upon that sites and their contingent communities receive those benefits which they prepare for. We have a remarkable opportunity here to work with local communities to increase green tourism, support local producers with their world heritage brand, and attract funding for research and local investment, among many other benefits. Local communities are part of the flow country and their customs and history and heritage will be celebrated by a world heritage inscription. Further to this, the local population are important custodians and stewards of the land, and they will help to ensure that this remains the greatest blanket bog in the world. And it's important that they see the benefits of this achievement. Next slide, please. Okay, we've got another beautiful flow country picture for you. I, th I think one of the benefits of a Peatland World Heritage Site is that this could introduce more people to these remarkable places, not just in the flow country, but in other parts of the world. It will be our job to ensure that any local increases in tourism are managed carefully. We can achieve this by directing tourists to areas of the bog which have the infrastructure to cope with visitors and interpretation signs and facilities to help enhance that experience. And this work is already ongoing. Uh, next slide, please. So what have we done so far? In early 2020, we were delighted to pass through the technical evaluation stage of the World Heritage process. And we've completed a thorough community consultation, which fortunately um, came to a close just a few months before COVID struck. The consultation involved a mixture of online and in-person events. Um, the in-person events included drop-in sessions, art installations, uh, such as um, Below the Blanket, uh, volunteer programs, kitchen table conversations, a World Heritage Exchange with Finnish World Heritage Sites, Old Rauma and Samalada Maki, and a series of public events featuring BBC presenters Neil Oliver and Professor Ian Stewart and Bath City World Heritage Site Chairman, you can see him in the middle, um, Barry Gilbertson. It was challenging to carry out such a widespread consultation in such a vast area with such a scattered population, but this is of course the nature of running a consultation in a bog. Uh, next slide, please. So what happens next? The next stage will be to pull together a full nomination to UNESCO. This is a complicated project, which is why we are so lucky to have the expertise of the Flow Country Partnership, which includes the University of Highlands and Islands, uh, the Highland Council, Nature Scott, the RSB, Wildland Limited, and many more. In tandem with the creation of this document, we will also go back out to consultation for a second time to ensure that community voices help to shape the project and any future World Heritage Site. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd really like to thank you all for taking the time to attend this session today and to find out more about the flow country. There has never been a better time to introduce a peatland to the World Heritage Site list. And we're optimistic that the flow country has what it takes to make the sleep. I encourage you to follow our progress on the flow country website and you can email me directly to find out more about our work. Uh, next and final slide, please. I just want to leave you with my favourite picture of the flow country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe, for that uh, overview of the bid to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And we wish you and everybody involved uh, with that bid um, all the best and we'll be following your progress. And thank you too for all the wonderful um, images. I think you win the prize for the best images so far. So before we hear from our next speaker, we have a short video. Um, Paul mentioned the work that Millie has been doing as a volunteer uh, at Forzenard, and uh, we have a short video which just sets out some of the work that Millie has been doing. So can we run the video, please? Here we are on Forest Nard Reserve um, and we're in an area called Dari. 
Uh, today we're going to just take a walk through the reserve and we're going to see what we can find and see what the bog is giving us in terms of how we feel about the bog and what we can see and discover out here. The landscape is just so vast. Um, it feels like it could just go on forever and you can see some of the mountains in the distance of the hills but no one else is here and you can just be out here in nature and that you can experience all of it. So this here we have bog asphodel, um, so it's a really beautiful yellow colour and it only came out a few weeks ago so it comes out in um, late June, early July but up until now you know it's not there at all and then all of a sudden you've got these bright bursts of yellow coming up all over the bog um, and that's bog asphodel. find lots of little magical spots of colour all around. Um, you just have to keep your eyes on the ground. It's all really beautiful. Once you start to spot them, you can see them everywhere. So we literally just turned around from looking at some plants um, and we've come across uh, Oblong Sanji um, which has managed to find quite a feast for itself. So it's managed to find itself a massive dragonfly but also a common blue damselfly. What Sanji do, they have these sticky hairs. Uh, they're carnivorous plants so they have these sticky hairs that will catch insects and then will slowly digest them um, with enzymes. Um, so it's a pretty gruesome way to go for the insect but a really cool adaption of this plant um, out on the peatlands. Without the bog, you know, the sanju wouldn't have anywhere to go and it's not going to survive um, in other environments. Um, so the bog is really important for species like this to be able to continue to uh, thrive. about the bog is it's similar in a way to how when people talk about space and they talk about how insignificant space makes them feel. Um, so when you're out on the bog in this massive landscape and you're just a tiny little pinprick in the bog. So it makes you feel kind of insignificant but it's nice in a way um, to still be part of the landscape but um, yeah such a tiny part of it is a change of perspective um, and makes you really think about I think to me it makes you think about how important this place is and how even if we can do a tiny little thing as this tiny person um, to help the bog you know we are just tiny in comparison to how important this place is. An absolutely wonderful video and now by the, the wonder of technology we've transported Millie back from uh, the flow country uh, to be with us here and she's just going to give a perspective as a young ambassador and volunteer at the flows. Millie. 
Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. It's really nice to see so many people and to be able to share how important the BOG is to all of us. Um, so I'm Amelia Revel Hayward. I'm currently an intern based up at the Forsenard Flows Reserve in Caithness in Sutherland. Um, and I just want to talk to you a little bit today about my perspective as a young person and someone who is doing on the ground restoration work on the peelands. Uh, next slide, please. So I grew up in the Highlands. I grew up around the peatlands, um, being outdoors on the t all the time and on the bogs. Um, but I don't think I fully appreciated how incredible the peatlands were until I came up to Forsenard and started to learn more. And so now I play a small role, but significant role um, with everyone coming together in the fight to restore the peatland ecosystems here. Um, it's been an incredible opportunity while I've been here to not just learn from the peatlands, but also all of the people that work and live on them. Everyone has incredible stories from the bog. Um, so in these short few months, I have come to love and respect the peatlands. And I really want to share that with you today. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so we've heard a bit about this already. Um, but just to reiterate, so 80% of peatlands in Scotland are degraded to some level, um, which is incredible. You know, we have such an important landscape, but so much of it isn't actually able to provide the services like storing carbon or providing a place for wildlife. Um, so the restoration process is going up on at Forsenard are integral if we want our peatlands to be a part of our future. They're occurring on a massive scale already. And it's incredible to see the transition from where we were 20 years ago and even to now. But it does require a lot of dedication and commitment from everyone who's working on them. There are many aspects to restoration in the flows from felling the original standing forestry to then re-wetting the ground, leveling it out, getting the vegetation such as sphagnum mosses that need to be there in order to have a healthy bog, and then the ongoing monitoring that needs to continue for many years to come. So like I said, it's a process that is gonna take lots of time and patience beyond probably most of your lifetimes and even mine um, until we can get to the stage where our peatlands are back to the stage they need to be. Next slide. Um, so some of the challenges that we face when it comes to restoring the bogs, we've got our practical challenges, such as the damaging of peatlands that is still occurring, both in the UK and globally. We've got draining of the bogs, extraction of peat and burning, which are still occurring. And that just feels like an uphill struggle for everyone who is currently working here. Um, on Forsenard in particular, we also still have lots of standing forestry around the reserve, place that we don't own, but are impacting on our, our, our abilities to restore the landscape. But I think for me, one of the biggest, biggest challenges is actually that the publics and people in power still don't have a solid understanding of how important or important our peatlands are. Um, and this is a massive challenge. How are we supposed to get people to care and invest in our peatlands if they don't know how special they are and they don't know why they're supposed to be protecting them? And I think finally, Roxanne and her team are doing such great work when it comes to researching peatlands, but we still have so much to learn. We didn't know until relatively recently how important they were. Um, and just imagine what we could find out in the, in the future. And next slide, please. So you can learn a lot from the bog. I think anyone who has spent time out on the peatlands could tell you what incredibly intricate and interconnected places they are, from the vast landscapes to the incredible carnivorous plants that live there and the wonderful birds. It's amazing when you can go out and see it all together. Um, as well as providing services for us and for wildlife that live there, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that 
the integral right of peatlands and other special places in nature to exist and be protected and not have us damage them. Um, I think Paul mentioned the ethical considerations that we should have for these natural places. And so I think that regardless of what they can give us, we still need to remember their integral right to exist. Um, and I also just want to give a mention to how spending time out on the bog can make you feel. I was recently involved in a project where we asked people how it makes them feel when they're out on the bog. And some of the words that came out were things like wilderness, calm, and hope. And I think that just really resonates how special the bog is to the people who live there. Next slide, please. So finally, I just want to say a few words on the future of the flow country. I think it's really inspirational to see the work that's been going on at Forsenard. Everyone who works there and lives there has been doing so much already to help protect the peatlands. And when you go, you can see all the different stages that the peatlands are currently in. You can see them in their pristine conditions and then you look a little to your right and you can see the restoration process, the places that are just being felled from standing forestry and the places that are 20 years down the journey. And then you can also see the forestry that is still there creating more challenges for us. And while it's really difficult to see the scars on this landscape, it's also signals a bit of hope when you can see the wildlife coming back and you can see the, the sphagnum mosses coming back up. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's hope. And I think it's difficult to see that sometimes, especially when we're talking about the scale that needs to be done to restore our peatlands. But it's really, I think we need to hold on to that hope. Um, and finally, I guess I want to say that with everyone here today, we're talking about peatlands and that's really promising, but I don't want the talks to just end today. I think we need to continue having these discussions and recognizing the role of peatlands and sharing our knowledge with others. We need to commit to protecting these special places against further destruction. Like I said, damage to the peatlands is still happening today. We need to stop that. We need to value how special they are. And for one last point, I would say that we're trying to battle the climate crisis here at COP. We cannot do that if we don't consider our nature and places like peatlands, which are so valuable in this fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Millie. Completely inspirational. And you gave us a really strong message of hope. Now we're coming towards the end of our session, but I'm going to just pose one question building on Millie's um, uh, outlook of hope and optimism. And I'm going to ask Paul um, uh, to just summarize from his perspective what he's hoping that people have learned about peatland today and what he wants people to take away um, from this session on the importance of peatland and peatland restoration. Paul. Um, Millie and I, I ha have been talking um, ab about this stuff over the past couple of days, and uh, she made the point that it takes 50 years to restore a bog. Now, we do know after sort of 15 years you start to get a flip in terms of the carbon from a damaged bog that is that has been plowed and planted the carbon is being released it kind of flips 15 years after restoration but to really get restoration takes 50 years and millie made the point none of you guys are going to see this but but she will um i, I sincerely hope so um i, I think this kind of idea that's a long a long term long-term investment long-term commitment is required I think the really, really key thing, and this is what Stuart Brooks, who's the chair of the IUCN Peatlands program said to me the other day, said the key thing we need is we have to scale up these efforts. So we've made an amazing start that you've, you've heard about today, but we've got a huge distance to go. 
The Scottish Government is leading the way with its £250 million investment, but that's not going to do the whole job. We really need to find ways to finance the scale up of peatland restoration if we're going to do the right thing for climate and if we're going to do the right thing for nature. And that is our key challenge. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm sure we can all endorse that. So to close our session today, I'm delighted to welcome Kevin Cox to the stage. Kevin is chairman of RSPB, which is absolutely fundamental in the work at the flows, as well as being the largest uh, conservation organization in Europe. Kevin's had a, a lifelong interest in wildlife and a deep involvement in nature conservation. So he is going to close our session for us. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. And I just want to say thank you very much to all of uh, the speakers. Um, I'm sure that everybody who's been here through this session will join me in, um, in, in, in recognizing what an impassioned and really quite extraordinary presentation we've just sat through. I think um, nobody will leave this place without recognizing how important peatlands are. Globally rare habitat, uh, extraordinarily important for both nature, climate and communities as well, which Millie brought out. Um, but we've abused them. And I think we've seen that. And to some extent, that abuse with the drainage, the planting of trees, the seeing them as waste areas is rather, uh, uh, rather like the arc that we've seen with the whole of what we've been doing to the planet and recognizing that we need to turn that around. But more than anything, I think what we've seen and heard today is a story of hope, a recognition that our peatlands genuinely are amazing places and that they can help us deliver to the climate challenge, to restore nature, to do more for biodiversity and to add those benefits that Millie talked about for people as well. And I think, again, we've heard about uh, how much of this work has been informed by science. Hearing from Des and Roxanne about the science that's gone into this, we now have a much greater understanding of how important peatlands are and why they can help us really tackle the, the nature and climate crisis. But we can't do it alone. And I think, again, much of this has been around seeing how much partnership working is really critical for this. Yes, we need money, but we also need people to work together to recognize the importance of these, these habitats. These are complex systems, and I think that came, came across really clearly. And there aren't easy solutions to this. It will take time to restore them. But it's that thing about if we don't start now, we won't see the benefits of that, certainly within Millie's lifetime, it might not happen with ours, but we really must start this process and we must do it at pace and at scale as well. So going away from this, I'd really like to, to take the message that all of us need to get out there and tell the story of peatlands because I think it's unrecognized and you know, we hear about trees, we've seen some of the issues with trees as well in the wrong place. We need all of our habitats to store carbon, to deliver for nature. And I have to admit, I haven't been to the flow country. I was supposed to go last year and it got cancelled because of the pandemic. I am now absolutely desperate to get up there to see this place for myself. I live on Dartmoor. I also see degraded peatland there. This is a really important story that we've heard. So I just want to finish by thanking everybody uh, for all of the things you do, from the science, from everything that goes on, from telling the stories of peatland to showing nature, and for Millie especially, for getting her hands dirty, getting down into the peat. I hope we can all go away and do the same. So thank you all very much. Thank you to all of our speakers, both on here in person and virtually. And thank you all for sharing this story as well. Thank you very much.